Well, good evening, everyone. Thank you for being with us tonight. We are going to give you another update from the land of Israel. This is our 15th update in a teaching series that we did not have planned until October the 7th when a horrific terrorist attack as terrorists from a Muslim terrorist group known as Hamas attacked innocent people in the land of Israel. And we've told you now for about 54 days about the horrific attack and what's happened in the aftermath of that. We initially were telling you that the estimated number of people who were murdered in that attack was around 1,400. The number has since been adjusted to about 1,200. And you say, well, what is the reason for the change? Well, so many bodies, so many bodies that needed to be processed and analyzed ended up that about 200 of those were the attackers themselves who were killed in the initial firefights that occurred on that October the 7th. And we've been talking about how the nation of Israel has reacted, how the people of Israel are reacting, how the people of America, how followers of Jesus around the world are dealing with this topic. And it's a security situation, it's a military situation, but you can never avoid politics. And what's going to come at some point in time is there are going to be a reckoning about how did this happen in Israel and how did the bad guys take advantage. It was an intelligence failure. And this past week, the director of the IDF Intelligence Division, the Military Intelligence Director, his name is Aaron Halivi, has announced that he knows that he will be the one to take ultimate responsibility for this. He said, after the war is over, I will have to go. He said, that morning, I already understood that it was all going to be blamed on me. And so... It's not time yet for investigations. It's not time yet for analysis of what security systems failed and what technology failed. But that time is coming and this gentleman has already announced he will be resigning because he will be held responsible ultimately for this. As we mentioned this past Sunday morning, this past Friday, five days ago, there was the beginning of a ceasefire. There was an agreement for a four-day ceasefire between Israel and Hamas. But remember that the sovereign state of Israel, the country, does not directly negotiate with a terrorist group, especially a terrorist group who just murdered over a thousand of their people. So this is a brokered ceasefire, and you're going to learn a bunch of diplomatic speak if you follow the stories. Qatar, the United States, and Egypt are brokering this deal. Now, Qatar, you're going to hear the name Qatar or Qatar, that country, a lot tonight. And you're going to hear it throughout the story. And it is exceedingly problematic, the role that they play in all of this. And I'll explain that further as we go along. But these three countries, America, Egypt, and Qatar, are trying to broker. And it was announced that a four-day ceasefire or humanitarian pause or operational pause would begin on Friday for the purpose of releasing hostages held by Hamas and other terrorist groups in the Gaza Strip in exchange for prisoners, Palestinian prisoners being held in Israeli prisons. And it was a three for one agreement, one hostage for three prisoners. And it was agreed upon that it would be women and children. Now you say, how do you have children as Palestinian prisoners? Well, it's because you're defining anyone under 18 years old. So the 17-year-old who attempted to stab a police officer is in this case called a child that's going to be released. So it was a negotiated four-day ceasefire, which would have been Friday, Saturday, Sunday, and Monday this past four days. That did go into effect 
And so on Friday, the first group of Israeli hostages was released. We showed you some photographs on Sunday. This is the group of 13, two different versions of that. Here's the entire group together. You can see their ages. There's a young boy age 9. There's an older lady age 78. Then a 54, then you see a mom on the middle there, Danielle Aloni, with her two girls, or, or that's the daughter, Amelia, age five. And then the next mom, Duran, with her two daughters, age four and age two. And then some other folks underneath, you see older ladies, uh, age 72, 78, 85, 79, 77. The one in the very middle, Yafa, Yafa Adar, she's the one I've been telling you about that was taken captive in the golf cart. You saw her photograph several times along the way. So this was the first group that was released on Friday. On Saturday, there was a second group of 13 Israelis, including eight children, that were released. Also, Hamas is releasing uh, hostages who have other nationalities besides the Israelis. They're releasing some from Thailand and some from the Philippines. But this is the group of 13 that were part of the second group that was released on Saturday. Then here is the third group that was released, in fact, while we were here at church on Sunday morning, Dallas time, Sunday night, Israel time. This is the group of hostages that was released in the third round. Again, you see a four-year-old. This four-year-old is a dual Israeli-American citizen, and the rest are Israeli citizens. Then the fourth group and the final group out of this original four-day agreed ceasefire was released on Monday. Nine children and two mothers. And here's another photograph of the 11 more Nine children and two mothers that were released on Monday. Well, then began some serious discussions. Could there be an extension of this ceasefire? And Hamas and Israel agreed through the negotiations with Qatar and the U.S. and the Egyptians on a two-day extension under the terms that Hamas would release at least 10 live Israelis under the... Hear the terminology, 10 live Israelis. They can release other nationalities if they want, and they have. They are holding dead bodies of Israelis. 10 live Israelis, and again, a three-for-one swap. So it would be a 10-person hostage release and a 30-person prisoner release, and that was an agreed-upon two-day extension, which meant group number five was released yesterday. And here is the group of 10 that were released. And these are all mostly older women. One 17-year-old young lady included in that 10. That was on the first day of the two-day extension. That made it day number five. And here's another group of all of those. And you see on the top middle, there's the 17-year-old young lady. And then today... Just an hour or two ago, the sixth group was released. And it's 12 Israeli hostages and some other citizens of other nations as well were released. And the question then becomes, is there going to be an extension of the ceasefire? Here's another way to look at the 12 that were released today, including several teenagers and also four Thailand nationals were released. And you keep hearing about those. And you say, how is that happening? Well, the Thai government, we think through the Russian government, is in negotiations with Hamas to have their citizens released. And many of them were foreign workers, those farm workers that were there that we told you about previously, and they have been released. The estimates are that there are 73 Israeli hostages that have been released so far. 149 are still being held. Estimates. Including a number of American citizens that have not been released yet. And so the question is, is there going to be an extension to the extension? And as we say in the media world, as of press time, 
We don't know the answer to that. That's still being negotiated right now. I've told you about a nine-month-old baby boy who was the youngest hostage. Well, he's now, of course, more than 10 months old. And the IDF is investigating Hamas's claim that the mom, the four-year-old, and the now 10-month-old were all killed while being held hostage. Number one, you cannot know that they are alive or dead based upon the word of Hamas. And number two, if Hamas claims that they've been killed, they're going to say they've been killed during an Israeli strike. However, you can't believe them. And number three, they're just now releasing this information as part of what we've taught you, the psychological warfare, but there's been a ceasefire for the last six days. So were they killed seven plus days ago and not announced yet? Are they still alive? Have they been dead all along? Did Hamas kill them? Again, this is part of the psychological warfare that's been going on this entire time. As hostages are being released, we told you 73 so far. Of course, there's beginning to get reports about what their conditions were like while they were being held hostage. But many of these hostages that have been released are children. A four-year-old and a nine-year-old and uh, another nine-year-old girl. And so there's no, as you would expect, there's no interrogation. There's no interview of the children. Some of the adults are not ready to talk. Some of the adults, you're starting to get a little bit of information out of them. And so the media has been able to interview family members of the hostages. Media members are not interviewing the released hostages. They're interviewing family members or doctors, the physicians. And you're starting to get a bit of a picture about the conditions under which they lived. And the bottom line answer is, they were all held in different ways, in different places. They were, some were moved often. Some were kept in the same place for a long time. Some were fairly well fed. Some were not. So the conditions varied all over the place. But here is a Jerusalem Post headline for you. And you see what it says. Women held hostage by Hamas in Gaza kept in cages. This is a statement that's given to the media by a hostage family representative. And it's not news because the Hamas social media channels have been showing child hostages being held in cages. And Hamas, under the continued attempt at psychological terrorism, did what we've learned about in previous hostage situations, especially if you know anything about the Vietnam War and the prisoners of war and those situations, Hamas forced the hostages to write letters describing how wonderfully treated they have been, how they were given all the food that they needed, all the medical care that they were needed, and one woman who was kidnapped alongside her five-year-old daughter, wrote a letter in Hebrew, of course, but it was translated into Arabic, and she thanked Hamas for their extraordinary humanity and the care provided to her five-year-old daughter who felt like a queen. The letter said, I will forever be a prisoner of love because she did not leave here with psychological trauma. They're forced to write letters, which are then used for propaganda by Hamas. As we leave this headline on the screen, let me tell you about another major failure in this whole endeavor. And that has been the work of the International Red Cross. You've probably heard, if you're watching the media, the ICRC, that term's used a lot, the International Committee of the Red Cross. They are supposed to be 
aggressive, proactive, insistent on getting permission to see hostages and give them the medical care that they need. And that whole system failed in this process. There's a story about an 84-year-old woman when she was returned to Israeli custody was immediately airlifted for emergency medical care because she did not get the medical treatment or the medicine she needed for those seven weeks that she was being held hostage. And her daughter is claiming that this is a double betrayal. Betrayal by Hamas who took my elderly mother captive and a betrayal by the Red Cross who did not insist upon giving her the medical care that she required. They even took actual medicine to meetings in Israel that were basically briefings given by the Red Cross personnel. And the family members tried to give the medicine to the Red Cross staff person and says, get this to my mom. And they refused to take it and refused to participate. They cannot take it. So again, another failure in this whole system. We haven't talked a lot about the military side of this much lately. For one reason, it's been on this now six-day ceasefire. But understand, the military campaign is not over. And this is the IDF spokesperson, Admiral Hagari is his name. But you see the headline, IDF is following Hamas leaders around the world and will pursue them wherever they are. In other words, most of the senior leadership of Hamas are not in Gaza. You know where many of them are. They're in Qatar, living in four-star and five-star hotels. And the IDF says, you don't need to think you're safe anywhere because we will find you. And it's a little bit reminiscent of what's called in history books the Nazi hunters. That once the state of Israel was founded in 1948... For decades after, they hunted down and found Nazis who had escaped from Germany and escaped from Europe. And a lot of them were living in South America. Some of them were living in the United States. And Israel says, we will find you wherever you are. Here's a bit of a good news story. And these two gentlemen are two of the doctors out of the 7,000 doctors of all kinds of specialties who have volunteered to go to Israel, and the first wave has arrived. A total of 12,000 medical personnel, doctors, nurses, and paramedics, have made arrangements with the health ministry of Israel to basically be on call to go as needed. Now, what would they do when they get there? You can imagine this. There's battlefield medicine. There is basic, I guess you call it family medical care needs for the doctors who have been called up into the reserve. So the, the general practitioner medicine personnel are serving in the army front. So there's medical care needed for the civilians and the people who are not at the war zone. So they're going to backfill that. Also, we've told you that hundreds of thousands, something like 250,000 Israelis are displaced from their homes because either it's too dangerous where they are or their homes were destroyed and they're living in hotels. So they're basically creating pop-up medical clinics in these different towns and different hotels and medical personnel from the United States, from Sweden, Canada, Belgium, Brazil, and New Zealand have so far, the first 150 have gone there. 
emergency medicine doctors, trauma surgeons, anesthesiologists, vascular surgeons, thoracic surgeons, intensive care specialists, burn specialists, plastic surgeons, rehabilitation specialists are all volunteering to go. And sad to tell you that also the forensic medical experts are also going to help continue to identify the bodies that were mutilated and burned. So those are part of the volunteers now. You know that our church is helping and some have volunteered to go to help. Some have already been. My wife, Breda, just returned, as you know, helping in all kinds of ways. She's not a medical person, but our church has been able to help in lots of different ways. And and you're seeing that from the world, or I will call it a subset of the world, who's interested and is trying to help in many, many ways. So that's your beginning of your headline updates for the day. Now I want to take you to the book of Genesis, please. I'll show you some more news in a moment, but let's go to the book of Genesis. We're going to look at chapter 34 and chapter 35, and if you were with us yesterday morning for Torah Tuesday, we read this passage, but I want to show you again, if you were with us yesterday, and look at it from an even deeper perspective, and if you weren't with us yesterday morning, you'll see it today. After years of reading the weekly Torah portion, every week on the same reading calendar, every year, after all the years that I've been doing that, sometimes I'm still amazed at how God's word is so perfectly timed at the moment we need it. So I'll remind you what happened on October the 7th, that something like 3,000 evil, barbaric terrorists broke through a border fence, killed a whole bunch of the border checkpoint guards, and then systematically went through with operational maps pinpointing homes, pinpointing the military guard posts with instructions for all these terrorists who speak Arabic spelled out phonetically in Hebrew to tell the women things that they should do, other commands to give to the people, the barbarism, the beheadings, just the evil that you can't even imagine. And one of the most significant and heinous parts of this is the sexual violence, the rape, systematic. That's what happened on October the 7th, this year. Now read with me Genesis chapter 34, verse 1. Now Dinah the daughter of Leah, whom she had born to Jacob, went out to visit the daughters of the land, the Canaanites. When Shechem, the son of Hamor the Hivite, the prince of the land, saw Dinah, he took her and lay with her by force. Rape. So let me give you a bit of background before we move further. We're studying the weekly Torah portion together. We're walking through the latter part of the book of Genesis. Jacob and his twin brother Esau have had a falling out over the deception of the birthright. Jacob has fled. He spent about 22 years away from Isaac, his father, and Rebecca, his mother. Rebecca has passed away. After about 22 years, Jacob is headed home. He has two wives who are sisters, Leah and Rachel. And then two of their maids, he has children with four different women. It'll end up being 12 boys, and they're going to all have the names that you'll eventually learn as the 12 tribes of Israel. And Leah is one of the wives of Jacob. And he has eventually 12 sons. At this point, he has 11 sons and one daughter. 
We don't know her exact age. A teenager, we think. And Jacob has uh, headed south out of Haran. It's modern day Syria today. And they've settled down and they're in an area. And we'll show you on a map in a few minutes where this is located. And they're surrounded by people who are pagans. Who worship idols. Who worship idolatry and witchcraft, paganism and immorality of all kinds. And somewhere along the way, Dinah, we think she's a teenager, goes out of the village, out of the camp of the people of Israel to visit these neighbors, the daughters of the land, the daughters of the Canaanites. Now, was she warned it could be dangerous for her? We don't know. You think so? Did she have permission to go or not? We don't know. We talked about it yesterday. Some people think she's got 11 brothers. She's ready to hang out with some girls her own age. But she ends up in this village. And the ruler, the king, his name is Hamor the Hivite. And his son's name is Shechem or Shechem. He's called the prince of the land. He saw her, he took her, and he lay with her by force. He raped her. Now this story takes place over 3,000 years ago. And in our weekly reading cycle, this is this week's reading. And I'm going to show you a couple more headlines now. The top one is from the Washington Post. The bottom is from Newsweek. And part of the complexity of the story that we've been trying to give you over the last now 15 teachings is all the different components about what has happened and what is happening and what will happen in Israel. But it's very hard to look backwards because there's new news every hour. Not every day, every hour. But one of the things that the media has not focused on much is this systematic abuse of the women of Israel that occurred on October the 7th. It was not by accident. This was not one guy who lost it and, and no. This was pre-planned, pre-organized, mission-driven, systematic terrorism by rape. And most of the media has ignored it. And that's why you're starting to see a hashtag. All of you are familiar with the Me Too movement. Me Too is a Hashtag on social media that says a woman, if she just chooses to go public in her story, says I was assaulted in whatever way she means. Me too. You're starting to see a new hashtag that says me too unless you're a Jew. The women are saying what about us? Washington Post, Israel investigates an elusive, horrific enemy, rape as a weapon of war. Newsweek, the silence from international bodies over Hamas's mass rapes is a betrayal of all women. So there are Israeli women, there are Jewish women, there are women of all kinds who are saying to the various women's groups, some NGOs, some UN bodies, national organizations. Why is no one else decrying this? Why is it being ignored? Well, if in all the story you're trying to either paint the Palestinians in Gaza as the innocents and Israelis as the abusers and the occupiers, well that doesn't fit this narrative. If you're trying to create a moral equivalence where this is just two uh, 
factions at war and there's problems and, and evil on both sides. Well, that doesn't fit this equivalent because this is not military. This is not a combat operation. This is systematic rape. And I, I hesitate how graphic to be, but the videos that the U.S. Congress persons and those in the media have been shown mostly taken by the Hamas terrorists themselves. I'm going to try to say this as eloquently as possible. You abuse the woman and then you shoot the woman back to back. Oh, by the way, you need to also know that many of the hostages were forced to watch these videos while being held in captivity, including the children forced to watch them. When I try to tell you how barbaric this is, I hesitate to tell you everything I know. So, understanding just this part of the story, I really ask our neighbors in Dallas who go to the pro-Palestinian rallies and say, ceasefire now, end to the Israeli occupation, I really wonder if they know what they're talking about. I've showed you this sign. It's all over these rallies from the river to the sea. Palestine will be free, which, again, it's a catchy little slogan, but you understand what it means. It's, it's genocide. There will be no Jews between the river and the sea, meaning the Jordan River and the Mediterranean Sea. And maybe you've seen, I started seeing people sending it to me today, a meme on social media that says, in a few weeks, two billion people around the world will celebrate a Jew who was born, the birth of a Jew who was born in Bethlehem, who lived between the river and the sea. This is what this headline means. Oh, by the way, in one of the most interesting stories of the week, one of my friends who writes for Israel 365 News discovered that a couple of different Jewish lawyers had filed a trademark for that from the river to the sea, Israel will be free. So that anybody who chooses to use that and print it on a t-shirt would have to buy the rights from them. <laughs> Assuming you follow law which is probably not going to stop anyone from printing T-shirts and posters. But two different Jewish lawyers have filed trademark requests for that. So back to the book of Genesis 34, now that we know what happened to Dinah. Verse 3 says, He, Shechem, the son who was the attacker, was deeply attracted to Dinah, the daughter of Jacob, and he loved the girl and spoke tenderly to her. So maybe he did love her, but it doesn't excuse at all what he did. It doesn't negate the assault. So Shechem spoke to his father saying, get me this young girl for a wife. Now Jacob heard that he had defiled Dinah, his daughter, but his sons were with his livestock in the field, so Jacob kept silent until they came in. We discussed this yesterday and. Even after all these times of reading the story, I can't explain Jacob's reactions. I have two daughters. Here's a man whose daughter, his only daughter, was raped and he finds out about it. And he doesn't react. We don't know why. Is he in shock? Is he in fear? Does he care? Does he not care? We don't know. And his sons, the big brothers, are out in the fields. Jacob kept silent until they came in. So here's a girl who's been raped and no one's speaking up for her. Again, what are we seeing in the media right now? UN and women's groups ignore or deny the systematic rape of Israeli women by Hamas. This is from the Daily Beast. 
See the headline in the red? Me too, unless you're a Jew. Many feminist and humanitarian groups strangely see no evil when the victims of mass sexual assault are Israeli Jews. So what we have in Genesis 34, again, this week's Torah portion. A girl is raped and her own father is being silent about it. The next verse, number 6. Then Hamor, the father of Shechem, went out to Jacob to speak with him. And the sons of Jacob, when they came in from the field, when they heard it, the men were grieved and they were very angry. Because he had done a disgraceful thing in Israel by lying with Jacob's daughter. For such a thing ought not to be done. And what an understatement that is. So dad is silent, but the brothers are angry. And we would say rightfully angry for what has been done to their sister. Now, we're going to connect a few dots for you over the next few minutes. But understand... When an attack occurs on an innocent victim and one party is silent and another party chooses to react, you know what often happens to the other party? They react too much because they think they have to make up for the silence on the other side. Verse 8, Hamor, the father, spoke with them. Dinah's brother saying, the soul of my son Shechem longs for your daughter and or sister. Please give her to him in marriage. Intermarry with us. Give your daughters to us and take our daughters for yourselves. Thus you shall live with us and the land shall be open before you. Live and trade in it and acquire property in it. In other words, dad says, yeah, we know what happened. But let's move on. Let's forget all that. Yeah, yeah, that wasn't, that wasn't really good. I, we know, but it's in the past. What is the world saying to the Israeli government right now? We know what happened. It wasn't good, but I mean, it's been 54 days. Let's move on. Let's talk politics and economics and Let's move on. Shechem also said to her father and her brothers, If I find favor in your sight, then I will give you whatever you say to me. Ask me ever so much bridal payment and gift, and I will give you according to as you say to me, but give me the girl in marriage. So dad offers to what? Buy their silence. To pay them off. Here's a map just so you can have a little sense of where you are. Remember what I've taught you about how to read the maps in your Bible about the land of Israel. Find the Sea of Galilee in the north and the Dead Sea in the south. The Jordan River right between it. Mediterranean Sea on the left. It's easy to orient yourself. And you see in the circle Shechem. Shechem. Right there. Shechem, the city named after this guy. His dad owned the whole territory and he had a city, several probably, but this city named after this guy. And you'll read this city name all throughout your Bible named after this guy we're reading about. Okay, continue. Genesis 34 verse 13. But Jacob's sons answered Shechem and his father Hamor with deceit. And if you've been walking with us through the book of Genesis, you know that's an important phrase because Jacob deceived his brother Esau and then Jacob had to flee and ended up with his uncle named Lavan or Laban who deceived Jacob. And so there's a family history of lying and deception. And now Jacob's sons are going to be the deceivers and the liars as the family trait continues. Jacob's sons answered Shechem and his father Hamor with deceit because he had defiled Dinah their sister. They said to them, we cannot do this thing to give our sister to one who is uncircumcised. Which is a medical statement. But it's more of a, you're an unbelieving pagan statement as well. For that would be a disgrace to us. Only on this condition will we consent to you. If you will become like us and that every male of you be circumcised, then we will give our daughters to you and we will take your daughters for ourselves and we will live with you and become one people. So the brothers say, here, here's an idea. 
knowing that those pagan Canaanites would never agree to such a thing. So they said, but if you will not listen to us to be circumcised, then we will take our daughter and go. Verse 18, now their words seemed reasonable to Hamor and Shechem, Hamor's son. The young man, Shechem, the son, did not delay to do the thing because he was delighted with Jacob's daughter. So now the brothers have a problem. These pagans are going to go through with this circumcision surgery when they didn't expect them to and their plan got blown up. Oh, by the way, what have the sons done? They've lied, they've deceived, but they've also completely dishonored and disgraced God's covenant that he made with the people of Israel about circumcision. Turned it into a deceptive war strategy, dishonoring the Lord. He did not delay to do the thing. He was delighted with Jacob's daughter. He was more respected than all the household of his father. So Amor and his son Shechem came to the gate of their city, spoke to the men of their city, saying, These men are friendly with us. Therefore, let them live in the land and trade in it, for behold, the land is large enough for them. Let us take their daughters in marriage and give our daughters to them. Only on this condition will the men consent to live with us, to become one people, that every male among us be circumcised as they are circumcised. Will not their livestock and their property and all their animals be ours? Only let us consent to them and they will live with us. So what are they saying? We're going to go through with this. It's going to be a painful surgery, but we're going to go through with this because we'll end up the winner financially in this matter. We'll take over all their possessions. Verse 24, all who went out of the gate of his city listened to Hamor the father and his son Shechem, and every male was circumcised, all who went out of the gate of his city. Now it came about on the third day when they were in pain, and all the medical people tell us that's the day after surgery when you're the weakest and in the most pain on the third day, the two of Jacob's sons, Simeon and Levi, Dinah's brothers, threw their father, Jacob, but also through their mother out of the four women, Leah, each took his sword and came upon the city unawares and killed every male. They killed Hamor and his son Shechem with the edge of the sword and they took Dinah from Shechem's house and went forth. So it seems that they rescued the hostage. We weren't told she was taken by force, but that's what you might assume. However, one man raped one woman, teenage girl we think. His father is in Encouraging the son, trying to sweep it under the rug. So you've got a father and a son, and a girl who's a victim, and then her two brothers, which we also assume brought some of the gang with them. They couldn't have done this by themselves. And they killed every man in the city. So you see how the deception and the violence is exploding. They rightfully want to avenge the attack on their sister. But then they take their anger and hatred out on an entire city. Verse 27 says, Jacob's sons came upon the slain and looted the city because they had defiled their sister. They took their flocks and their herds and their donkeys and that which was in the city and that which was in the field and they captured and looted all their wealth and all their little ones and their wives, even all that was in the houses. So the question is, what was the appropriate response to the evil inflicted upon Dinah? Should these people have been avenged? Should they have been punished? Should they have been attacked or, or revenge taken out on them? Yes, you, you think yes is the answer, but, but what's the right response level? What about the innocent civilians, quote unquote, and what about all the collateral damage? Now we don't know any more details of the story. Shechem assaulted Dinah. Did he do it publicly? It doesn't tell us that. Did all of the other men of the city know it and endorse it and cheer it on? We don't know any of that. 
But when you read your Bible, which I'll remind you is about real people in real circumstances, and you try to look at it from different lenses, political, military, sociological, judicial, spiritual, when you look at it with different lenses, there's a, so much depth to it. And the question is, what would have been the appropriate response to the evil inflicted upon Dinah? So the two brothers, which it doesn't say, but we're going to guess with their posse, kill all the men of the city, loot everything, burn everything maybe, and bring their sister home. Back to dad, Jacob, verse 30. Then Jacob said to Simeon and Levi, you have brought trouble on me by making me odious among, or hated among the inhabitants of the land, among the Canaanites and the Perizzites. And my men being few in number, they will gather together against me and attack me, and I will be destroyed, I and my household. Jacob, the man whose name is changed to Israel, Worried about what other nations would think of the Jews because they exacted such overwhelming and violent revenge. Have you been reading your news right now? What is the world going to say about us if we are this violent? Does the evildoer deserve judgment and justice? Yes. But are there innocent civilians? Yes. And then what's the world going to think about us? Now, remember the fundamental difference. This is one attacker and one victim, not thousands of attackers and thousands of victims endorsed by their ruling government. That's a different situation. But the statement Jacob says, you've brought trouble on me. You guys just made this harder for me. What have we not seen from Jacob in the whole story? Number one, what have we not seen from Jacob? Care for his daughter. I assume he loved his daughter. I assume he's heartbroken over what happened. He doesn't say it. We also haven't seen Jacob pray. You brought trouble on me. And the brothers reply, should he treat our sister as a harlot? Should he defile? Should he rape our sister? And that's where chapter 34 ends. And we really don't know what happens in the family dynamics very much after that. But we do want to show you a couple verses from chapter 35 because it is the next chapter of the story, literally in the Bible, in the next chapter of their lives. But there's been some sort of time gap in between. How did the family heal? How did the family reconnect? How did they communicate? Did they? We're not told any of that. But now that we remember that Bible people are real people, and now that we know some of our personal friends who are struggling in Israel with these kinds of questions, you can start to ask what went on between chapter 34 and chapter 35. And then let me read you chapter 35, verse 1. God said to Jacob, arise, go up to Bethel. Remember in Hebrew, Beth means house. El is the name of God. It's a place that Jacob had visited previously, and he's going to go back to called, that he named the house of God. Go up to Bethel and live there and make an altar to God who appeared to you when you fled from your brother Esau. So Jacob said to his household and all who were with him, put away the foreign gods which are among you and purify yourselves and change your garments. And let us arise and go up to Bethel, and I will make an altar there to God who answered me in the day of my distress and has been with me wherever I have gone. So they gave to Jacob all the foreign gods which they had and the rings which were in their ears, and Jacob hid them under the oak which was near Shechem. Jacob says God has told us it's time to go to the promised land, it's time to begin the, the living out of the covenant, and we need to get ourselves right spiritually, and part of that is we've all been... Influenced by the pagans, we all, in our big extended family, 
There's got to be idols and statues and pagan materials. We need to get rid of all that. We need to bury it. We need to throw it away. We need to get right with God. And again, that's what he should be doing as the father of the family. But now that you've read chapter 34, you wonder where's Jacob been all this time? And then one more verse, Genesis 35, 5. As they journeyed, there was a great terror upon the cities which were around them. And they did not pursue the sons of Jacob. So as they began their journey further south, all the surrounding people groups, little kingdoms, didn't dare attack the party that was traveling with Jacob because they had heard how violent Simeon and Levi had been in Shechem. In political terms, and military terms, they were deterred. There was a deterrent effect. So one of the geopolitical questions that's being asked right now about Israel is how does Israel deter other nations from attacking them? Most notably, Hezbollah, which is not a nation, it's a terrorist group, but it's in the nation of Lebanon. How do they deter Hezbollah from attacking Israel from the north? Now, President Biden has done a lot of things to stand with Israel. Some things I, I wish he would have done stronger. He's, he's, he and the Secretary of State, Mr. Blinken, are saying these terms, and they've said it for now seven weeks. If other groups are thinking of taking advantage of the situation, don't. And that's been the key word that they've said over and over don't don't now you can imagine how deterrent that word is but the idea is don't now you have to back up your words with actions but that's politicians of all parties but in the geopolitical lens how does Israel deter someone else from attacking them like happened on October the 7th. Here's another headline. This is think tank stuff. Council on Foreign Relations. Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu, see the quote, hopes to reassert Israeli deterrence and show Israel's enemies the high cost of attacking it. One of the reasons Israel has pledged to destroy Hamas is because Hamas is evil and needs to be avenged. But another reason they've pledged to eradicate Hamas is to deter other groups from trying the same thing. And this headline is Washington Post on the day of the attack, October 7th. And even on the first day, they said, I, they said, the attack caught Israel's vaunted military and intelligence services off guard and sparked bitter recriminations after months of warnings from security officials about the country's deteriorating capacity for deterrence. So, again, politicians and media folks who sit in offices away from battlefields can debate these things that obviously Hamas was not deterred before October the 7th. So let's wrap up with a few thoughts now that we've read Genesis 35 and we've tried to tell you the current events. The question then and now, what is the righteous and effective response to evil? How much do you fight back? Fundamentally, that's the question the Israeli war cabinet is asking every single moment of every single day. How much do you fight back? And every person who talks to them, the American government, the UN, the Qataris, the Egyptians, everybody has a different opinion on that answer. How much do you fight back? How can you resist being too passive and silent like Jacob was? How can you resist being too violent and aggressive like Simeon and Levi were? Another headline for you. 
you know we're now in the sixth day of this ceasefire and there's negotiations about extending it, but Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu prepares to restart war as the end of the pause nears. Netanyahu promised the Gaza war would resume as the war cabinet discussed hostage releases. Quote, in recent days I have heard a question. After completing this stage of the return of our hostages, will Israel go back to fighting? Question mark. My answer is an unequivocal yes, he says. So again, if we back up one slide, what is the righteous and effective response to evil? That's what their government is fighting over. That's the question that came from Genesis 34 and 35. And when Netanyahu says, we will go back to fighting, it's an unequivocal yes. You can imagine the next headline, you could have written it yourself, Biden and Netanyahu disagree regarding continuation of IDF activity in Gaza. And our American leadership, Joe Biden especially, has stood with Israel better than most people I thought he would over these last 54 days. But I promise you, and I'm not a politician and I'm not that smart, but I promise you the pressure he is being placed under by his own party and his own staff in a lot of ways is to tell Israel we're not standing with you anymore. And so we need to pray that he will not give in to that pressure. And the last headline I'm going to show you is this one. Qatar seeks deal for all Israeli captives. This was from earlier today. So here's a phrase that you're going to hear a lot over the next few weeks, and I need you to know it. And I've taught you and told you to learn how to read the media. You're going to hear a phrase a lot. The phrase is, all for all. Let's just end this. Let's everybody stop fighting. Put down your arms. You release all. You release all. And it'll be over and everybody just goes home. It's called all for all in short diplomatic speak. And if you don't know what you're talking about and you don't know what the terms mean, that sounds nice and it sounds friendly and it sounds agreeable and everybody just Take it and move on. All for all. So, I want to define for you what that means. Something like 150 hostages remain in Israel right now. Most of them are men. And most of them are military age men and women. Elderly men, military age men and women. So they are innocent civilians who were taken hostage in the original attack on October the 7th. Or they were IDF soldiers, reservists, who were not in military duty at the time and were taken hostage as a civilian. Or they have been IDF soldiers in a combat environment taken hostage since then. So approximately 150 who have done no crime. All on one side. All for all. What's this side? You release all Palestinian prisoners in Israeli prisons. As so far... 150 or more have been released. Women and, as they like to call them, children. These are teenage boys who try to throw stones at police and stab police and set things on fire. So they're called women and children, but you need to understand what the terminology is. Okay. All 150 approximate innocent hostages who've committed no crimes all Palestinian prisoners in Israeli prisons. What number is that? Something between 6,000 and 7,000. 
including convicted mass murderers, terrorists. You say, all oh, these were teenagers throwing rocks at a police car. Okay. But what about the mastermind of mass murder terrorist killings? So you're going to hear the phrase, all for all. But I want you to understand what that really means. 150 versus 6,000. Numerically, that's what all for all means. Te- uh, terrorized hostages versus criminals in a jail. Not all who've been convicted in the legal system but were arrested for crimes. Not all of them have had their cases adjudicated yet. But that's what all for all means. 150 versus six to 7,000 hostages prisoners, criminals, charged and or convicted, okay? So when you start hearing that from the Qataris, who are starting already to say it, it's a problem. When you start hearing it from the Americans, it's really a problem. And if you don't know, and everybody starts saying, I wish this would just end, I wish Trey would stop talking about it, let's just do all for all and end this thing, you now can explain what all for all means. And I told you I needed to explain to you about the Qataris before we finish. The masterminds of Hamas, the leading terrorist group leaders, don't live in Gaza. Some live in Turkey. Some live in other places. A lot of them live in Qatar. Qatar funds... Hamas. You say, why are they involved in this? They're not next door. They're in a different part of the world. Why are they involved? Well, because they have direct communication with Hamas. How does that happen? Because the leaders live in Qatar. So the people who are funding it slash encouraging it are the people who are negotiating as supposedly the middleman in the conversation. And the Egyptians, they're involved. Why? Well, because they share a border. The southern part of Gaza Strip runs into Egypt. They're Arabs. They're Muslims. Why don't they let the innocent civilians of Gaza enter? They don't want them. Because they know they've been influenced by the hateful violence of Hamas. Okay? So you're going to hear about this term a lot. And now you can explain it. So what do we need to do? We need to pray for leaders. Prime Minister Netanyahu, first of all, the leaders of the IDF, second of all, President Biden, third of all, and the leaders of other countries as well. Here's three scriptures that we're going to assign you homework to pray over these in the next days. Psalm 78, verse 72, David shepherded them according to the integrity of his heart and guided them with his skillful hands. So leaders need to have integrity and skill. Daniel 2, it is the Lord, he, who changes the times and the epics. He removes kings and establishes kings. He gives wisdom to wise men and knowledge to men of understanding. And so we're praying for leaders to be wise and have knowledge and have understanding. And Proverbs 8, 14, counsel is mine and sound wisdom, the Lord speaking. I am understanding, power is mine. By me, kings reign and rulers decree justice. By me, princes rule and nobles, all who judge rightly. I love those who love me and, I, and, dil- and those who diligently seek me will find me. So we pray for leaders to love God and diligently seek after God. Because I will... Remind all of us, including myself, we need to remember how exceedingly difficult and complex these leadership positions are. And you need to have brains and intellect and wisdom and knowledge and understanding and discernment and courage and boldness to have a chance to be an effective leader in the middle of all. So we'll finish tonight as we've done each time saying together Psalm 20. Here we go. May the Lord answer you in the day of trouble. May the name of the God of Jacob set you securely on high. May he send you help from the sanctuary and support you from Zion. 
May he remember all your meal offerings and find your burnt offering acceptable. May he grant you your heart's desire and fulfill all your counsel. We will sing for joy over your victory. And in the name of our God, we will set up our banners. May the Lord fulfill all your petitions. Now I know that the Lord saves his anointed. He will answer him from his holy heaven with the saving strength of his right hand. Some boast in chariots and some in horses. But we will boast in the name of the Lord our God. They have bowed down and fallen, but we have risen and stood upright. Save, O Lord. May the king answer us in the day we call. Let's pray. Father, please, please, please protect the hostages, their hearts, their minds, their bodies. Give them supernatural strength, even without enough food or medicine. We pray for the hostages that have been released, that medically, physically you would heal them, but also emotionally and mentally you would heal them. We pray for the children. God, we pray that they would miraculously recover. We pray for the families whose loved ones have not been released. We pray for the families of those who have lost loved ones who have been killed. Please give them comfort and strength and hope only comes from you. We pray for the leader of Israel, the leader of America, the leader of the militaries, the leader of the other nations. Presidents and prime ministers, generals, admirals, secretaries of state. They would have wisdom and knowledge and understanding and discernment and truth. And for those of us who follow after Jesus, the Jew who was born between the river and the sea, may we stand for truth, may we discern what we read in the media, so we can speak truth. We love you in the name of Jesus. Amen. Good night.